see, I have a little accent. I'm actually from Australia. So I went to medical school in Australia, and I was a GP down under. And then I fell in love with an American, and he whisked me to Mission Viejo, California. And that was 26 years ago. And I decided to not do all my licensure again for medicine in the United States because I was so interested in um, wellness and prevention. So I've spent my career here really investigating the question, what creates health? And so now I am a health coach and I am a speaker. I speak at conferences all around the world, educating people about that question, what creates health? And as you'll see, my focus is to really educate each individual person so that as patients, and we're all patients, we can be more empowered to know what questions to ask. And so I come from what's called a functional model where I look at the underlying causes. And today we're gonna to be talking particularly about the gut, which is one of the most misunderstood organs. And to start today, I have this particular slide which really speaks to how the gut is an overall barometer of our emotional and physical health. And people never think about that because, you know, the gut's something we don't really like to talk about. It's kind of messy. And, but I'm going to be talking about poop today. And we're going to be talking about how it works so that you can really get, have this whole new appreciation for this amazing organ in your body. And this is something I want you to lock in your mind. So this is probably the most important piece of information today. Have you heard that the gut is your second brain? It's your second brain. It's your second brain. You have a brain in your head, and our whole gut is considered second brain. In fact, there's a book called Your Second Brain, The Gut, Your Second Brain. And this is why. You know when you get colds and flu, and we think, oh, yes, uh, I've picked up something. Well, 70 to 80% of your immune system is in your gut. So if you don't have good digestive health, your immune system is going to be lacking. Another good reason to really listen today and learn how you can optimize your digestive health. And the other aspect is 80 to 90% of serotonin is made in your gut. So serotonin is a feel-good neurotransmitter. It is the neurotransmitter that we increase when someone's on Prozac, Prozac or Paxil or Zoloft. Serotonin, most of your serotonin is made in your gut. So now what I'm doing is educating a lot of mental health practitioners. A lot of my uh, therapists that I'm coaching uh, are actually asking questions about digestive health. And I think they should. Because if we're really looking at mental health, which is a huge issue, let's face it, then we're missing the full picture if we're not looking at the gut. And most people have never given that consideration. So for our mental health, our emotional health, our physical health, and the gut has its own nervous system. It's called the enteric nervous system. It's actually made in utero before the baby's spinal cord and nervous system is made. And it can work independently. And that's why when we say we have a gut feeling, it's true. So we have a whole nervous system in the gut, which is another reason why we call it the second brain. So I have another really special thing to help you appreciate. As you can see, what I'm trying to lay out is the importance of the gut. So I brought a little friend. Um, you're gonna like this. <laughs> so I had this made, and this is an exact replica of what is inside us. This, but this is very large. Your stomach really is not this big but because I speak to large audiences, it's, I just make that particularly big. This is your esophagus, and I'm gonna to explain to you the whole anatomy of your gut. And what I have in this bag is the exact length of your small and large intestine that's sitting inside of you now. So what I'm gonna do is, what is your name? Rajika. Say that again. <laughs> Rajika. Rajika. Yeah. Rajika, that's beautiful. So would you hold this for me? And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna get you to walk all the way down there so everybody can see how long this is. So let's go down here so you can see how long this gut is. Keep going, keep going. Okay, there you are. All right, so of course I've got this all laid out, which is not how it's like sitting inside of us. And this is the end that you of course can tell the health of your gut. And what I often say to people is, if you have fluffy floaties 
or stinky sinkies. That tells you a lot about what's happening in your gut. So if you have good digestive health and you're pooping every day and when you go to the bathroom, it floats, that's a good thing. It's loose, easy to come out. Stinky sinkies, they've been in there way too long. So that's an indication. And I'm actually going to show you a chart and I'll hand it out so you can see. No one has to talk about it, but it gives you an indication of what's happening inside your gut by the look of your stool, otherwise known as poop. So when you think about it, thank you. What I'm going to do is have you move forward to me now and imagine all of this somehow fits inside of us. Like, how does that happen? How does food really find its way to be processed and find its way out while it sits in us like this? Like, it's just a miracle. Thank you so much. Isn't that just a miracle? So, someone says they have irritable bowel. I take that word literally. Like something is irritating our gut that holds it in, holds, gives it a, a constrictor because the, the intestine has a small intestine lining, has small muscle lining. There's muscle around this. So when we are stressed and we walk around like this all the time, our gut is doing the same thing. It's not working properly. So stress is one of the big reasons that people have digestive issues. Exercise is fabulous for gut health because every muscle in your body is being exercised, including the smooth muscle lining of your gut. So exercise is fabulous for so many reasons, including serotonin. You've probably heard of that. And you probably feel it. You know, after you exercise, you kind of get this, uh, your mood is lifted. That's your neurotransmitters actually being activated as well as all kinds of other benefits um, in your whole body. So what I'm going to explain to you is just some things that people ask me most about with the gut. So you've heard of reflux. Reflux, when people get burning, it's, that's serious. You never want to ignore reflux because it's a sign that something is happening in the body and you, you literally get that acid reflux up in the esophagus. So this is the esophagus. And we have a sphincter here between the stomach and the esophagus. And when that sphincter is loose, then the reflux can happen in the esophagus and you can get burning of that lining. And that's a serious condition. If you've ever heard of a thing called Barrett's esophagus, it's considered cancer of the esophagus. And very unfortunate thing in my life is my brother, uh, I'm one of three and I'm the youngest and my brother is a pilot and always wanted to be a pilot. And he flew for Australia and Singapore Airlines and. And pilots have very irregular schedules, as you can imagine. Their, um, their hours are very regular. And he had reflux and he ignored it. And he was flying internationally. And you can always kind of blame it on something else that, oh, you know, my diet or I'm not getting enough sleep. And sadly, he ignored it too long. And by the time he paid attention to it, he got Barrett's esophagus. And at 55, he died of esophageal cancer. So it's just something that I'm very, aware of and I like to educate people, do not ignore reflux. Now, one of the things that uh, people do, you know, when you're lying at night, reflux gets worse because see how the, they can drain down and can, so people put their head of the bed up and that helps with reflux. Uh, another thing that helps with reflux is just watching the food, spicy foods. I love lots of spicy foods, but tomatoes, chocolate, coffee, like things like that can, can aggravate this sphincter and can make reflux worse. So if you know anyone with reflux, sometimes you hear them cough <coughs> a little bit, they just after a meal even, they <coughs> and they don't think of anything, but that's probably reflux. So one of the gifts you can do is just pay attention and having come here, just say to people, you know, you should have that looked at. And there are many things that you can do for reflux. Now, I should say outside, even though I am a doctor in Australia, I'm not here to diagnose or treat. This is not my job. I'm a health coach. I educate. And just like I just did, educate people about awareness so then you can go to your doctor and ask different questions. Now, one of the best things you can do for your digestive health is chew your food. And particularly, we were talking about earlier. Every bite, 23 times, can you believe? 23 times. It takes a long time to eat. 
Because if you're not chewing your food and you go, chew, swallow, chew, swallow, then you are getting bolus of undigested food in the stomach. The stomach can't handle it because we've only got so many digestive enzymes. And so then you get to this small intestine. Now the small intestine, uh, it's considered, it's, it's, it's called small because it's uh, only one cell thick. And this is where absorption takes place. And this is where something called leaky gut happens. Now, most people think leaky gut happens at this end, but no, leaky gut happens the small intestine. And I actually have a picture of leaky gut. Let me, let me scoot up to show you some pictures now to keep it interesting here. So with leaky gut, one of the big issues is uh, lack of absorption. So what we put in our mouth matters. And I've got a picture here of the standard American diet. Now, how we ever considered that food, I don't know. I mean, really, it's like cardboard, it's like junk. I have a picture here of a uh, trash dump. That's a real trash dump. And then I put the food and the trash dump side by side so you could see the similarities. That this, what we call food, processed food, which has no color, is so similar to a trash dump. And so what we put in our mouth matters. And you heard that saying, we are what we eat? Mm -hmm. Well, we're so much more than that because yes, we are what we eat. But if we are not digesting the food, if we're not able to break it down, the stomach, and then we're not absorbing it in the small intestine, and then we don't excrete it well, then that's going to contribute to inflammation and disease in the body. So we actually are what we eat, digest, absorb, excrete, and utilize, all of those things. So what are we really digesting? Oh, the other thing, other little tip I want to give you is one of the other benefits, things you can do to help your digestive system is the way you sit on the toilet. You might have heard of this. So we aren't meant to sit as toilets are made. In fact, they're really poorly made. They're very poorly invented. Have you heard of this too? You ever heard of this? Yes. Good, I'm glad you have. So the stomach has, a, it takes about two to four hours for food to be digested in the stomach and then about one to five hours in the small intestine and then most of the time is taken in this long, large intestine which actually absorbs all the water and forms the stool to excrete. So I think I have a picture here of how you meant to sit on the toilet. Or maybe I don't, I have a little picture to show you. So have you heard of those uh, squatty potties? They're everywhere now. And you can get them at Target. Oh my, I've been talking about this for years and that you just put it at the base of your toilet and it elevates your feet so that the angle uh, changes and it can make a huge difference to elimination. They're called squatty potties. Cheap, they're like 12 bucks at Target and I have one on every toilet in my, uh, in my house. Okay, so the other thing I really wanna emphasize here why am I talking about all of this? Well, when your digestive system is not working and you're not absorbing properly, it contributes to many conditions that you would never consider. We've kind of hinted at depression because of serotonin, but manifestation of poor digestion can show up as these things that you would probably never link. ADD, ADHD, uh, arthritis, asthma, anything related to inflammation of the body. So I believe every doctor, no matter what specialty, needs to be asking about the gut. Uh, dermatologists, eczema and psoriasis are autoimmune conditions, and autoimmune conditions are created by inflammation of the body, and one of the first places that starts is in the gut. So I believe every dermatologist should be asking questions about the digestive system. But you now are gonna be educated to be able to really assess your own digestive health. Now, I do have a chart. I bought a chart so I could hand it around here. So this is called, and I think I have a picture of this here. Ah, this is called the Bristol Stool Chart. And you can look at this on Google, can easily find it. And it tells you, again, you know how we were talking about the fluffy floaties that come at the end of the colon here. Then what your stool looks like tells me a lot about what's happening inside the body. And they have seven classifications of your stool from 
type 1 to type 7. And you can just look there and kind of think, oh, okay, that's where I am about. The ideal stool, and I love Dr. Oz compares it to a ripe banana. So if you imagine an overripe banana that's brown and curved and kind of mushy and soft, that's your ideal stool. And it comes out easily. You don't have to strain. If it's hard and craggy like rabbit pellets, that's constipation. Dehydration, the number one cause of constipation is dehydration. And that's why they tell us here all the time to drink, drink, drink. Because when you exercise and you're sweating, you are depleting your body even more and you need, I say to people, you want to drink half your body weight in ounces of water every single day. Or 80 ounces minimum. That's a lot of water and you're going to be peeing a lot. But our body is primarily water and if we're not feeding our body water, then the, the stool is going to get really hard. And so for some people, it can be as simple as that. That helps. If you really suffer from constipation and you know, when I do seminars, I have people come up and say, oh, I haven't pooped for four days. You'd be amazed, you know, how, how often I hear that story. Because it's not something we talk about either, you know, it's not something that we share around the dinner table. Well, I do, but I'm allowed to. <laughs> um, and so one of the things that you can, because then I really want to help people, um, of course they would go and get investigated because you want to make sure there's no medical issue and that's not what I'm here for to treat medically. But something that can help is something called magnesium glycinate. Now for some reason it's particularly the glycinate that helps. Now magnesium is a muscle relaxant and remember I talked about how there's muscle lining uh, the colon. So you take the magnesium right before you go to bed. I usually start about 400 milligrams. You can get it at Sprouts, you can get it at Mother's, pretty easy to get, but it's the glycinate version, about 400 milligrams, right before you go to bed with a big glass of water. And then when you wake up, another big glass of water, and you should have a bowel motion in the morning. People are amazed how this works. And then you just play around with the dose. You might need a little more, you might need a little less. The, own, the way you know you're overdosing magnesium is you get diarrhea. But it also helps you sleep because magnesium is a muscle relaxant and so many of us are depleted in magnesium. It also helps with muscle cramps. A lot of times when you get muscle cramps from exercising, it's because you're magnesium deficient. So it's one of the biggest deficiencies um, in our culture. So I hope that helps with the constipation question because I know that's a big issue for people. And then the other end of the spectrum is the diarrhea, the liquid. And I am also amazed how many people have always had liquid stool but never knew it was wrong because you don't talk about it. That's a sign of inflammation or if you've had a gallbladder out, particularly early on, then your body is having trouble breaking down the fats because that's the function of bile. If you've had your gallbladder removed, you really do have to have specific dietary guidelines to follow because you, you may have issues with breaking down fat. You might need some extra digestive enzymes that have particularly the amylase that helps um, with the digestive symptoms. So that would just help you right there with looking at um, your your um, inflammation and the links with your health. Now I want to talk about leaky gut because doctors don't talk about this. It's more of an understanding from a functional perspective and I want to remind you that leaky gut happens at the small intestine. This is where all of your absorption takes place. And for this I need volunteers so we might all participate in this. Okay, so let me explain it first. Okay, I've got my own little cheat sheet here as well. Okay, so I've got this picture here to show you. So the small intestine is one cell thick. And your small intestine is the barrier. So when we eat, let's say we have a hamburger and we have, we get it, it's a big beefy burger and it's got onions and it's got tomato and it's got all kinds of stuff in it. It has to get into the stomach the stomach has to break it down, but a lot of us are deficient in digestive enzymes, so it doesn't break down fully. So we get undigested food in the small intestine. And the small intestine's job is to decide what is going to get pooped out 
and what is going to get absorbed into the bloodstream that red there is the bloodstream the small intestines job is to say these nutrients are good i'm taking them to the blood these are bad i'm getting rid of them and it's only one cell thick and the small intestine has these really tight barriers to stop bad things getting into our blood and with this with our food industry right now, full of GMOs, full of chemicals, what's happened is this, this tight junction is getting inflamed. It's getting damaged by all the chemicals. So it loosens. And so things get leak into the blood we don't want because of the tight junction. It's actually called interstitial junctions. Gets into the blood and that sets up an autoimmune reaction. So I'm gonna demonstrate this because it's so, so important. So I want two people. Will you be my, I'll be, I'll have you be my bloodstream. So you come over here for me. Yes. Actually, no, I'm gonna have you be my small intestine. I want you to stand side by side because you know each other, right? And so you're gonna stand side by side really, really tight. And then I need one other person to stand right here for me. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Okay, so this is the, this is the small intestine junction. This, what, this is, says, I'm, say, a GMO chemical, and I've been eaten, and I want to get into the bloodstream, but you guys are not going to let me because you're tight junction. So you stop me getting in there. Stop. Oh, you're so good. Oh, yeah, okay, so I can't get in to the bloodstream over there. But what happens in our life, stress, processed foods, GMO foods, is these junctions get a little loose. So just loosen up there, they get a little inflamed. And so they're not quite as tight. And so me, the GMO, I'm gonna get in there and I'm in the bloodstream now. And when it gets in the bloodstream, I exert an inflammatory reaction. And this is the beginning of autoimmune conditions. The small intestine is so crucial to what gets into the blood and then what reaction is exerted. Thank you, very good. Doesn't it help to kind of see it, to see it visually? So if you see down here, so what is autoimmune? Rheumatoid arthritis, fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue, thyroid, low thyroid, which is rampant, especially in women, low thyroid. And who, what endocrinologist asks you about your gut and how your small intestine is working? And, and that's called leaky gut. You see the word leaky is because the leaky junctions. Now, some doctors don't believe in leaky gut because we, I would say we, because I was trained this way years ago in the very traditional model. It's really been a, a fairly new, since integrative medicine has come out and we're understanding all the links between all the systems in the body. Leaky gut is real, and if you go to a functional medicine practitioner, they can treat leaky gut for you. And if you go to functionalmedicineinstitute.org and you put your zip code in, they will uh, be able to, you'll be able to see who practices this kind of thinking. And so that you can get a, a deeper appreciation of what's really going on in your body. It's called functional medicine. So I hope that helps. It also, um, I brought my, one of my favorite books. If you're interested in this, and I know not everyone's interested in all the science, but Dr. David Perlmutter, he is a new, functional neurologist, and he wrote a book called Grain Brain, you might be familiar with, the effect of sugar on the brain. And this is his next book, which is called Brain Maker. And this talks about the role of the gut for our brain health. It's a fabulous book. He has a very specific focus on autism because if anybody, if you're in the autism movement at all, you know that we're always talking about the link between gut health as it relates to the autistic spectrum and how important it is to heal the gut when in those kids. So as you can see, there's so much to talk about here. Um, I'm gonna give you now some solutions because that's what you came for. So I have four areas, four things you can do to help with your gut. So I've got another about 10 or so minutes uh, of this, just so you know how much longer we've got, because I want to give you some solutions, things that you can actually do, because remember, I'm not treating here, this is about lifestyle. And I wrote a book called uh, 
is your lifestyle killing you, which is basically my 30 plus years of working in this field and understanding that we can do a lot with lifestyle, but doctors don't have time to teach you that because, you know, as a doctor, I only had 15 minutes with a person and that's, I can't ask questions because I'm, I can't hang, hang out and wait for the answer. So you really need to get educated about these lifestyle factors. So first of all, remove toxins. So as you saw, we have to be mindful of what we put in our body because that creates this potential leaky gut. And I've got a list of the toxins. I do recommend that you, re you use digestive enzymes. And if you go to my website, you can certainly see the ones that I recommend because you do want to make sure that you have a really high quality digestive enzyme. And most people, like I do use, I, I'm lucky that I've got a fairly good gut function and I still use digestive enzymes with every meal. Uh, my husband, who has some gluten sensitivity, uh, he uses digestive enzymes with every meal. It just helps break the food down as much as possible so that by the time it gets the small intestine, these interstitial barriers don't have to work as hard. So digestive enzymes are really, that's how they work. A lot of people wonder how they work. They just help break down the food. And then you want, the thing I haven't talked about is this whole gut has bacteria in it. It's called the microbiome. And these bacteria play a crucial role in every metabolic process. And with all the antibiotics that we've had in our life and processed foods, our gut bacteria is really lacking. So I recommend everyone take a probiotic. And since we've got a small group here, I have a sample for everybody. So this is the probiotic that I use and I recommend to my clients. Does anyone take a probiotic, by the way? Yes, 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 yes. Okay, so uh, this one I love because I travel a lot and I, these don't have to be refrigerated and the active bacteria get activated on the saliva. So I take one of these every day and when I travel, I take double because you know the link between immunity and the gut. And if you're on antibiotics, you wanna double or triple your probiotics because an antibiotic gets rid of these good gut bacteria and you want to take a probiotic, but don't take it at the same time as your antibiotic. So anyone want to try one of these? You're very welcome to try here. You just open it and we can actually take it together. <laughs> and it's uh, got two bacteria in it. Did I give you that? I'll show you how to open, uh, how to take it. I want to take one too? Yes, okay. Um, yes, yes, uh, you can get it from uh, health practitioners that, that recommend it. So you can get it from my website or you can get it from me if you like. I've got a way for you to get it at my price. Yeah, you don't get it at the store. So this is how I take it. Let's take it together. <laughs> so it, I just open it up. Now, even though it says to mix it with water, I don't mess with it, mix it with water. I just open it. It takes like a pixie stick and you throw it down. <clears throat> Chase it with water because it's kind of like, like powdery. Unless you've had nothing to eat today. Never take a probiotic on an empty stomach. The reason is when we wake up first thing in the morning, we have an acidic stomach because, and uh, the probiotic is working at the large intestine level. So it has to get through the acidic stomach. And so you wanna take a probiotic after you've eaten, ideally, because then you, your stomach is not as acidic. So after any meal, doesn't matter, but just not on an empty stomach. And I take it every day. And as I said, I kind of double up when I want extra immunity. My daughter is a second grade teacher. So <laughs> new second grade teacher. So I've got her taking three of these a day, like in this early parts of the school year, while all the, all the bugs are everywhere, because I consider the gut is a key immune organ, and most people don't. So I also have her on vitamin C, of course, and um, some good fish oil to, as an anti-inflammatory. I dose her up. So I believe everyone needs to take a probiotic. And if, I usually say for kids, 
maybe they could start at about 11 or 12. Um, a lot of babies, they're actually using probiotics for colic because we believe colic is because the gut bacteria is not uh, mature enough to, for the gut to work. And here's something really interesting. So we have this microbiome, and I, I mean, I do whole seminars on the microbiome. So um, the microbiome is simply all the microbes that live in our body. And we have 10 times the number of microbes in our body as human cells. 10 times. We have more microbes in our body. The question is, like, are we really human because we have so many microbes? And all these microbes have genetic material which are impacting us. So when we're born, we get an inoculation of our microbiome. So when we come down the vaginal canal, the baby gets inoculated with the microbiome. So the research has shown that C-section babies have more likely to get more immune disorders because they haven't got that inoculation of the microbiome. So now hospitals are actually, for C-section babies, they're swabbing the mum's vaginal canal and they're putting it in the baby's mouth and under the arms and on the skin so the baby gets the absorption of uh, inoculation. I wish I knew that 34 years ago when I had mine. Right? <laughs> Tell me about it. I had a C-section too, yeah. right? And, I have a blonde hair, blue eyed, and she does tend to get more sinus issues and um, allergies. Now, I don't. Blonde hair, blue eyed tend to get more. And I'm not going to beat myself up, right, because I had a C-section, because I had to. But now we know. And now we can actually ask. Now, not all hospitals do that, but mothers are now asking for that as we get more and more educated about it. So I would love to talk about the microbiome all day, but we just have a few more minutes. And then repair damage. So here's my list of toxins. The first thing to help your gut is to reduce gluten as much as possible. Now, gluten is in everything. Gluten, it's a thickener. And gluten is in your uh, soups, your canned soups, your sauces, your salad dressings. Here, I'm gonna, here we go. Um, so, and this is not about celiac, which is people that can't have gluten and all, but, but just be going as, reducing your gluten as much as possible, being mindful of that. Now, I'm not saying that gluten-free foods are healthy because they're full of what? Sugar. sugar. This is a gluten-free food. I bought this. I talk about sugar a lot too. This thing here, whatever you might, like is Dr. Pepper or um, it might be Mountain Dew. And I know kids, they could drink this whole thing, like the full-on soda. 64 teaspoons of sugar. And sugar is one of the most inflammatory things we can put in our body. So sugar is right up there for me and number one. Now, I do my coaching work, I focus very much on sugar addiction. That's a whole other topic we could talk about, but it really is an addiction. And it happens, the brain pathway for sugar addiction is very similar to, as alcohol. And every month I do a sugar cleanse. Uh, a group on the phone that I help, I help people get off the sugar roller coaster. And that's a sugar cleanse up there. It's just something if you're interested, just let me know because I have a great passion. I am a recovering sugar addict. I know what it's like to just be controlled and consumed by the desire for carbohydrates. And when I say sugar, I, I have a picture here that I made. I'm talking about bread. I'm talking about cereal, I'm talking about cupcakes and cookies and pasta and spaghetti. And sugar comes in many forms. So, and for different strokes for different folks, my sugar of choice, as weird as it sounds, is black licorice. Good. I love black licorice. Yeah, and they make the best. See, most people, if you don't like it, yeah, you hate Australia it. Oh really my gosh. You can buy it now here. It's I know. I know. <laughs> I can get it at Target. I, I, I check out at Mother's Market the other day, and they've got my New Zealand black licorice. I said, no. You know, it's like an alcoholic, truly. And I will admit it. Uh, the fennel, <laughs> to me it does. <laughs> Sugar-free. It's, I mean, it's fat-free. It's fat-free. It's fat-free. And we all think, oh, fat-free is good. But, you know, yeah. that was the biggest nutritional myth that we were fed. And it's full of sugar. So anyway, so I know what it's like. And uh, so I help people. If you're interested in 
in that. I can help you with that. So here's some other, here's some other lists. So toxins come in many forms. Not for everyone. Dairy might be fine for some people, but for some people, their guts react to dairy. So I just suggest do a little experiment and see, like don't have dairy for a week and see how you feel, how your gut health is, if you're really watching your gut health. Um, highly processed foods, spaghetti, pasta. I teach people how to use cauliflower rice instead of like the white rice and spaghetti. Um, spaghetti squash you the do you ever use spaghetti squash instead of spaghetti and because that's low glycemic and oh my gosh one of my big bugbears when kids have these cupcakes and they've got that blue icing and that red icing they are carcinogenic those dyes and we know they are uh let's just not even go to what the leaky gut says about that chemical uh and we still use it so just being mindful of what we're putting in our body. So there's my picture of sugar. So you want to keep your blood sugar in a stable range as you can. And there's just so much we can do about that with understanding about low glycemic. I have a lot of resources on my website. So drkarenwolf.org programs. I've got Karen's Kitchen. Now, I'm not a cook. Far from it. But I teach people how to make spaghetti squash and cauliflower rice and simple stuff so that you can substitute. You can just improve your diet little by little. Okay, um, the other thing I'm going to share with you is where do you think, I've talked all about this, but where do you think digestion begins? Where does it begin? Probably the brain. The brain. As soon as we start thinking about food, as soon as we start thinking about it, if I was to, if I was to have you imagine a lemon, and I imagine you cutting a lemon, and then bringing that lemon so that you could smell it. Most of us start salivating because we can imagine that, that lemon and the body, all we've done is use our mind. So digestion does begin in the brain. And one of the biggest tips I can give you, and I started today talking about this, camels, you ever seen camels chew and chew and chew? I want you, when you think about digestion, I want you to think back to camel and chew your food. 23 times at least with every bite so that it gets as small as possible by the time it gets to the stomach so it gives the stomach the best opportunity to break down the food so that by the time it gets to the small intestine absorption can be easy so something is simple you don't have to buy that you just chew 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 your food and smell your food that old-fashioned way of actually sitting down to dinner and Doing a prayer before you eat is beautiful for digestion. It slows everything down. So all of those things. Oh, and look at this. Um, I love this image because uh, this, this speaks to how we have 10 times more microbes in our body than human cells. And that little baby saying, are we really human? Because we have all of these microbes in our body. It's just amazing. So this is the probiotic I love and I've had such success with a lot of my clients on, and you can certainly talk to me afterwards if you want to get some of this, because you can't get it at the store. We need probiotics because our gut bacteria has just been really insulted with sleep deprivation and sleep and antibiotics and pharmaceuticals, and the balance of microbes are just way out of whack. So I am a big believer, as important as a multivitamin is, I think everyone needs to take a probiotic pro-good biotic bacteria. And get some sauerkraut. If you like sauerkraut, that's a really good fermented food that has probiotic as well. That'll be really good um, post-surgery, we were talking about earlier. And it's also a prebiotic, which is a fertilizer for the good bacteria. So anything you can do to really help with digestive health. And I've got some other resources uh, on my website uh, for you to look at. And then I think the number four, where's my list here? The number four is repair damage. So I really think uh, taking a probiotic every day, good and good, getting good essential fatty acids, avocados, your friends, avocados have such great fat in them. Um, we're really deficient in fat, and that's really important for our digestive health. I think everyone should take a really good multivitamin and mineral. That's really, really important because we're really deficient in our 
this gut has a lot of work to do in our life and it's tired and it gets depleted on a cellular level. So I think I got through everything. Um, questions? Yes. Uh, you're talking about water. Yes. My, my coworkers swear by oh. alkaline water. What oh are yes. Your thoughts on that? Well, it's so interesting. Um, let's back up about that whole acid alkali. There's no doubt that the more alkaline our body is, the healthier we are. Cancer cannot survive in an acid environment. So there's a big movement to talk about acid versus alkaline. Now, whether the alkaline water is going to be, uh, actually has it in it, you know, that's the big question. Rather than just saying, let's have the water, let's eat an alkaline diet. So, processed food, acid. Um, vegetables, alkaline. The closer the food you eat to nature, the more alkaline it's going to be. So, I'm, I'm more of kind of a moderation person. Yes, drink water, water, water. Uh, I don't know that you're going to get huge benefit from alkaline water. Just get the water in, but eat an alkaline-based diet, which is a more vegetable-based diet, and healthy plant proteins. And I really appreciate you coming because it is Saturday and you've got places to go, things to do. So I really appreciate it. I'm going to hang around so that you can ask me questions personally, so anybody that needs to go can get on with this Saturday. So thank you very much.